Welcome to Well Good Movies, the podcast that gives you the movies well worth watching, even if there are some duds along the way. Combining questions, trivia and games, every episode we're challenged to watch a piece of film history to decide whether it deserves to be remembered for all time in our movie vault. With every film chosen in our previous episode, it's the perfect way to watch and discuss along at home. But don't just take my word for it. Here's a snippet of what to expect in today's episode. So I didn't actually write down the year of the movies. Cool, Uh, so they came out at some point. (laughs) They come out at some point. Um, Anything that I could probably say is probably going to give away what the movies are we're just gonna have to wait and see what my picks are if i win i guess because anything i say is probably going to give away what they are and i don't want to spoil the cool events. so i i compliment in simplicity and reese ran with it yeah exactly <laughs> all right mr demille i'm ready for my close-up are you not entertained Oh, hi, Mark. Well, good movies. Hello, and welcome to Well Good Movies, the podcast that gives you the movies well worth watching, even if there are some bumps along the way. I'm your host, David Osger, and I am joined by my co host, Team captain of the victors of the Cineworld Pixar Quiz 2018, Craig McDonald. Hello, Craig. I know why you're being nice to me this week. <laughs> I know exactly why you're trying to butter me up as opposed to other week. Oh, right. Okay. Because I'm going to do a little re- role reversal on you, David. Oh, okay. Right. Right. You ready? <laughs> Did I know this was coming? So. <laughs> well, probably. Well, okay. Hello, okay. everyone. Welcome to Well Good Movies. I'm your host, Craig McDonald. And this, this week, I'm joined by, as always, my co-host, the quoted by New uh. York Post... <laughs> Uh, as chiming in on various social issues, David Oscar. Yes, yeah, not not a fun time, especially when you've got Americans then commenting and messaging you, even on posts that have nothing to do with what that article was about. So, yeah, thanks I, for that. I'm just you. making a point. People think that I'm hard on you on this. It's, it's not just me who gets annoyed by you sometimes. <laughs> Apparently it's Americans. Yeah, well, the quality publications, you know, in the UK covered that story and did not go, you know, using uh, crappy language as they did. But, uh, yeah. Very much, uh, as I think one of our guests was uh, talking about earlier this week, very much the son of <laughs> of New York or, or America. And yeah, from my experience, I can definitely uh, say that that is true. But <laughs> So yeah, uh, but no, I, I didn't think of that in terms of buttering up. It literally today, my Facebook memories came up and... Uh, oh yeah, it's where we won the Pixar quiz where yeah. I'm dressed as Edna Mode. Yeah, so four years ago today that happened and I was remem- you know, just remembering how... We won a, a cinema quiz against a bunch of children while you had a very, very dodgy wig on. And I think it was also quite hot then as well. It wasn't that bad. I think I think it was where I shared the memory two years later and I said, it's ironic, I was wearing a wig in this picture and now my hair probably looks more like that. That's true. But yeah, no, it was great. It was it was my second favourite Cineworld quiz win, favorite, as in favourites. That, that was, yeah, that was the first one I ever won. My favorite one I, was when I won the Pokemon one. Ah, uh, yeah. Because cool. like, it's the only thing I've ever gone into full force just saying, I'm going to win that. <laughs> and then do, missing only two marks out of the entire thing. Hmm. As opposed to us in that Pixar quiz, only missing eight. We need to get back to some movie quizzes, I guess. <laughs> yes, we do. Could, uh, ruin that. But uh, yeah, you might also notice I put bumps along the way now, Craig. Yeah, I did wonder why that was. I, I just, you know, thought it would help your... Uh, issues in the past of being like oh it does it have to be a dud or does it have to be well good but i did think it was a bit too harsh to, to okay sure it. yeah <laughs> right so as we alluded to there craig uh, we talk about movies well worth watching despite bumps along the way so just to tease the audience at home do you think today's movie is a bump in the road or well worth watching i think this is one of the smoothest experiences i've had in a while so definitely bumpless awesome Right, well, we'll soon get on to why that might be and what me and our guests might think of today's film. Uh, But Craig, for anybody uh, who just needs a recap or didn't catch our previous episode, can you just recap us on how we came to talk about this film today? Yeah. So after you uh, got your chosen subject of Avatar Mm -hmm. and made me sit through that film again, uh, you, I think it's safe to say, had a disastrous loss against Jesse. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and and you didn't even give me a chance to redeem myself with the. Um... Oh yeah, I never gave you the uh, the tiebreak. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Um, 
It'll come up in some bonus episode, I'm sure. Nah, it's lost the time. <laughs> um, but after you lost to Jesse, Jesse decided that she was going to give us the film we're discussing this week. Very much wanting to look at some of the uh, being a role reversal of Avatar insofar as that ended up talking about um, allusions to cultures which were not necessarily represented well or even consulted to a film where minorities are better discussed and better approached in many situations, as well as being one of two films that won, when one best picture was the one that Jesse actually wanted. So she gave us The Shape of Water. Awesome. Yeah, well, uh, we look forward to discussing The Shape of Water today and undertaking our usual task of deciding whether it goes into the movie vault, our vault of movies that celebrate chosen films for all time. But before all of that, uh, we first have to introduce our two guests. Uh, the first joined us back in uh, February, I believe, for our episode discussing Snatch. Yeah, avoid the innuendo. <laughs> Sorry, it's just, <laughs> I, I dulled I, my mind so much. <laughs> you had one chance, Greg, you had one chance. You can uh, So yeah, joined us on our episode discussing Snatch. It's movie buff and YouTuber, Rio's Positive POV. Hello. How are we all doing? Good. Uh, how are you? I know you've had a recent uh, injury, Reese. Are you okay? Yes, I'm perfectly fine. My head has been glued back together and all is well. It's kind of ironic because we were recently talking about the film Erin Brockovich. So we were talking there about, you know, true life films and we were saying about female leads in those films. So we brought up uh, I, Tonya. I don't know if if you had an I, I, Tonya sort of moment or... No, I was flying backwards, tried to turn back around by ice skating and clipped my ice skate and fell 15 feet and smashed my head off the ice. 15 feet? Yes, I flew about 15 feet took me a second to get up. I put my hand to the back of my head to see what was going on. And there was blood all over my hand. And I had to go to the hospital and get glued back up, which is always fun. I I, I despise hospitals. I wanted to leave it as it was, but the A&E person there told me, yeah, you probably get it glued up. The way you described that there and the way you said like you flew, I just immediately thought chicken run when Babs is like, I flew, I flew. No, I definitely, <laughs> I definitely flew. It was, a, it was a, it felt like it went on for about five minutes, but. No, see, I had the stupid, doing. the stupid thought in my head of when, when you were talking about falling, I, I thought you had 15 feet down. Oh, so I was, a, right. I was like, oh, how are yes. you alive? <laughs> no, uh, 15 four, feet forward. Yeah. That would be an interesting ice rink as well in which you... Yeah, that's why to. I was <laughs> equally confused. But then I realised, oh wait, he probably fell holo- horizontally. <laughs> uh, it was so bad that one of the people that came over had headphones on and he said that he heard the hit of my head hitting the ice oh, through his headphones. Oh dear. So, and I heard it too. It was a very loud thump. But obviously we'll uh, get on to your thoughts about The Shape of Water later, but um, just worth teasing, this is one of your favourite films as well, isn't it? This is one of my favourite films, and this is one of the films I fight on Twitter with all the time. Oh, okay. Getting back to the social media hate, that'll be yeah, fun to go the, down. Yeah, when you were talking earlier, I, I kind of like it. I like, I'm not arguing, it's probably the wrong word, but having mm. healthy discussions is good. And oh, David was not having well. healthy discussions. <laughs> no. I was. The people responding to me. Um, <laughs> I, I'll explain my rationale for it, but it technically isn't. Mm, okay, well, I, I was willing to have a healthy conversation then. That's, that yeah, way. that's more appropriate. Yeah. But now we uh, introduce our next guest. Uh, this is their first time joining us on Well Good Movies. It is freelance film critic Katie Smith Wong. Hello, Katie. Hello. Hello. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Thank you, you for having me. Like Reese, you are also in sunny London, <laughs> enjoying the heat. <laughs> so you're both experiencing. It's, it's unbearable, that. but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, I can't. I can't really mince my words about that. It's really, really hot. I'm still not used to it after what several days and the park is now yellow it's not it's not great <laughs> oh dear yeah that's uh it's it's still quite warm here you know not you know between bristol and, and wales at the moment but uh yeah i think uh, london is definitely where you're in the city you've got already a lot of uh, heat coming off of cars and trains you know yeah, that's it's gonna just, get it's the like worst. an oven so uh yeah please katie tell us um about yourself um about your work and uh what sort of involvement you have in the world of uh, film and uh reviewing 
Uh, I've been I've been reviewing films since 2012. I was I started writing when I was in between jobs. Didn't really think much would come of it until I started writing for various different sites and stuff. Um, mainly focusing on uh, film reviews, but I've written features that uh, aim to increase Asian representation in Western cinema. When films like Crazy Rich Asians, Shang Chi came out, and then Farewell, obviously as well as more recently, Everything Everywhere All At Once. So it's just me trying to raise that um, presence that Asian actors can do more than just be that fish out of water role or the martial arts, you know, role, that kind of thing. So it, uh, it's just it's just like, you know, bringing my own perspective into something that is quite a very niche part in cinema. Um, Favourite films that <laughs> are very... very very conventional. Um, I mean, like my favorite film of all time is Train Spotting. Like for this year, of this year, for instance. Um, I mean, Everything Everywhere at Once is one of my favorites. And then uh, Turning Red from by Pic by is it Pixar? Yeah, Pixar. And and the documentary Fire of Love, which is about Maurice and Katia Kraft, who are two who were two married volcanologists. That's coming out in c- cinemas at the end of this month. I cannot recommend that highly enough. Um, but yeah, it's like with genres, foreign cinema, action, I love martial arts films. But if there's anything with a sword in it, that's me. I'm, I'm sold. That's why. So when I saw the, the trailer for the latest Mar- uh, Mission Impossible film, mm. you see Rebecca Ferguson with the sword. I was like, yeah, that's me. I'm going to get my, I'm going <laughs> to, I can't wait for this screen. <laughs> so, but with regards to like recent blockbusters and stuff, I mean, yeah, I did see the Thor Love and Thunder. Um, it's not good, but it's not great. You know, I can't. I don't. I don't hate it, but I don't love it as much as I do other MCU films. Um, I watched the Gray the Gray Man the other day. Um, still not sold on it, but I'll, I'll leave that. I'll leave that for another day. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, as we're talking about Marvel, and you mentioned the Shang Chi, you know, how, how do you find that one compared to something like Black Panther? You were talking about Asian representation. Do you think that that you know does as much for that kind of Audience. I think it, it yeah it, it does because you know a lot of I think with similar to Black Panther loads of Asian Asian people probably were waiting for a superhero uh, to be in a really big franchise like Marvel so Shang Chi was just like similar to Black Panther but I, I think I don't know I'm not sure if the response was as prominent mm. as it was with um, with Black Panther because you know Black Panther got you know got nominated for an Oscar. Mm. True. And I think I think Shang Chi just kind of suffered from the from COVID as well. Not a lot. I don't think many people watched it. As many people watched it because of COVID. Um, same similar to Turning Red, it was a home release. Yeah. So you know, I think it's been it's an uphill struggle. But you know, with a sequel being on the, in the, on the cards, I'm sure that there's you know room for improvement. Yeah, and I'm sure, like I said, I think just in terms of that kind of natural representation as well i think we're getting you know better and better at that you know without going deep into this film because i know everyone sort of loves it i mean craig finally got the man uh, managed to see it uh, a few days ago is um everything every way all at once and when i was watching that i was just like how refreshing to watch a film like that in which it does you know represent this family but it you know even though they are the traditions of that kind of asian representation there it's done very naturally that you're just seeing what could be seen as just any other family you know just a family with problems a father a mother you know a daughter it's you know it's great to see that kind of representation mm, it's, it's one of those films that yeah you could probably you know some 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 skept, you know skeptics will probably dismiss it because it is an asian-led film but it, it's themes it's lessons it's comedy it's you know it's emotion it's very universal i think there is something that a lot of people can take from it, whether, you know, it's from, from family or from the comedy or that, you know, the, the weird way the universe can work or even how we communicate. And so, yeah, I think there's, it's, it's, there's different, definitely something for everybody. So, yeah, let's get on to our discussion of today's film, which is The Shape of Water from 2017. 
Uh, the synopsis of this is, at a top secret research facility in the 1960s, a lonely janitor forms a unique relationship with an amphibious creature that is being held in captivity. Uh, so this is directed by Gilmero del Toro. Uh, he is also uh, credited as uh, writing the film as well and uh, is obviously known as well for taking Best Picture at the Oscars. Uh, in terms of your cast, you've got Sally Hawkins uh, as Eliza Esposito. Uh, you've got also got Octavia Spencer, uh, Michael Shannon, Doug Jones, and Richard Jenkins as Giles, as well as Michael uh, Stolberg as Dr. Robert Hofstetler. So, yeah, this is a Oscar-winning film uh, brought to our attention because of its themes of you know supernatural elements i guess and talking about you know marginalized communities in some ways uh, there's obviously a lot of themes here about events that were happening at that time in terms of like you know the west versus the east um but then also it's very much a love story um and kind of a love letter i guess to cinema in a lot of ways which the oscars tends uh, to favor quite a lot so you know, first off, I'd kind of ask you guys, what are your thoughts on Gelmero del Toro? Because I guess a lot of his influence is obviously on this film um, and a lot of the touches that make a Gelmero del Toro film are seen, you know, in the shape of water. And I think that he's had such a big impact on cinema and on fans of cinema you know what what are your experiences with uh with him reese have you were you a fan before the shape of water had you seen much before yeah so this is the thing i've always been a fan of his um i love the visual style the production design on his films is always is always quality it seems very otherworldly even though they're all set in on earth they always seem like they're on a different planet somehow the production design is always one of the major things uh, pan's labyrinth is one of my favorite films um and overall I'm a, I'm a massive fan of his to be perfectly honest um the only film i didn't like as much is the most recent one nightmare early and um, but still a lot of the, the the stuff that he's known for is is in that it's more of the story that i didn't like of that one rather than the actual directing and, and production design and everything like that but overall i'm a massive fan and what about yourself, Katie? What, what was your experiences with him before? Yeah, I'm a big fan of his. Like Reese, um, Pan's Labyrinth is one of the one of my favourite films because you know it's a very, very real world, but he imbues such a fantastical element in it. It's very easy to visualise that, you know, get sucked into that escapism that um, he seems seems to create from very small nuances then that, that almost yeah it become like a fairy tale you don't want to you know you're not sure whether to believe it or not but you can't help but just get engrossed in it do you think that um his you know his kind of strengths lie you know obviously he's kind of gone across a few different genres as well and he's one of those fam- filmmakers that have kind of dabbled in your sort of like larger productions um but then sort of smaller stories as well um you know so either of you would you say that you like him across the board or do you think he works better when he's doing like his big blockbusters like pacific rim etc or do you think it's better when he's doing something a bit more nuanced and smaller scale like pan's labyrinth i think with the smaller scale projects he's able to kind of fine tune that that unique vi- that unique vision that he has but whereas i think in certain blockbusters it's very easy to get lost in special effects and the scale of everything um but but that's just my um, that's just me <laughs> you know i agree i prefer the smaller stuff where he can proper get his his teeth into it um the worlds that he creates are, are much better in those he's he's an awesome director but when he kind of gets to tell his own story via um everything which encompasses that not just the actual script itself that's definitely where he shines for me for sure would you say, Reese, that he has a kind of like specific genre? Because I guess, again, like if you look at other kind of big name directors, you could say that they have a specific type of film that they make. He, he's always, he sits in within the kind of horror genre for me. Uh, Creature Features is kind of, of where he is at. Um, but even though it's horror, all his films have all got a, a, a high amount of tenderness as well. So even though you've got these monsters in in all these films, they're, they're characters themselves rather than just a kind of antagonist so, or a protagonist in, in certain other films. And so the way he puts them forward is definitely in a unique way. 
and you make it feel like they're an actual person themselves, even if it could be a, a creature or someone that doesn't even speak. Yeah, I think I, I also think of a lot of the films like very much, like you said, I think Creature Features is like a good way of putting it, is that kind of like old school approach to Hollywood films in the ter- you know terms of the theatrics of uh, horror and kind of focusing on, you know, the characters and the stories and very much dabbles in that world of sort of dark fairy tales, uh, which I guess, you know, we talked about very at the beginning of this podcast, Craig, is, you know, he is talking about that kind of, you've got like stuff like uh, Narnia, et cetera, or, you know, like where it's very much like a kind of bright, cheery world, which might've been, you know, sort of attacked by darkness. But Del Toro seems to kind of thrive off the like darker stories. He kind of enjoys that. And I think that it gives himself, you know, a, a very special wheelhouse, which to me, it was always interesting if he ever did do the Hobbit films. You know, I think that he's had so many projects in the past that people do this, do that. You know, when is this going to come out? And he's just so wrapped up in so many different things, even producing as well. He produces a load of stuff. So, yeah, would have I think I always would have thought it would have been interesting to see his take on the Hobbit. Because I think you see little bits of maybe like designs in there that maybe sort of stemmed from when he was working on early on. But um, but to see that kind of like approach to sort of dark fairy tales and... Um, kind of folk tales in a way he seems to sort of thrive off that kind of stuff yeah his hobbit would have been probably much better than the ones that came out if they could have condensed it into one film as well well they talk um, to me about the hobbit would probably be, <laughs> I, I didn't mind them as a whole it just felt like they could be literally cut into one film yeah, yeah the hobbit is is not even half the size of one book in the original trilogy you don't need to have three yeah. long overly long films I think also with Del Toro, if he were to have done the Hobbit, he would have, he may have he may have incorporated more more of his own touch on the creatures that were in the story, like the trolls and the dragon. I think he would have brought a more he would have brought something very different that might have helped elevate that whole series and condense it. Yeah, I definitely agree that the character uh, the character and creature designs are probably my biggest draw for any uh, del toro film um especially here and also just pan's labyrinth i remember very little because of how young how much younger i was when i saw the film uh but the creature is just iconically etched in my head so do you guys think that his oscar was like well overdue do you think you know it was a kind of did he not win one for pan's uh, best achievement in cinematography, best achievement in art direction, best achievement in makeup, but no uh, nominee for writing, nominee for music, a nominee for foreign language film of the year, but didn't. Uh, it didn't win foreign language film of the year. No. Oh, that's gonna bug me. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm looking it up. Two thousand and seven. The lives so. of others. The lives of others won that year. Mm. And what it was won. the Oscar winner of two thousand and seven? Just general best picture. Uh, that was The Departed. Uh, right, okay. Hmm. I, like, I love The Departed, but Pans is much more. See, if I knew this is how invested all of you would have been in the Oscars, I would have just daddy, I would have dedicated VHS Corner to it. <laughs> yeah. Pans wasn't even in Best Picture. That's how that's how much of a farce it was. Yeah, I, it definitely we've come a long way. We're still a long way to go with with stuff with foreign language films actually being yeah. considered and also, in Best Picture. I, I, I don't see... I have a gripe about The Departed because it's based on Infernal Fez, which is yeah. a great movie. And it's just like... Duh. It's always my go-to when people moan about remakes is The Departed because the original movie, Internal Affairs, was, was quality as well. And The Departed people love. So anytime anyone moans about a, an American remake, I always remind them of that. I'm not the biggest fan of remakes anyway myself, but I think people judge them before they have a chance to do anything. They seem to say sometimes when people win an Oscar that they won it for the for the wrong film. For me, it, it's 100% the right film, but he still should have won it for, for Pans as well, for sure. Yeah. So basically, he should have more Oscars. <laughs> he yeah, should definitely, definitely have two, yeah. 100%. Because those two films, are, for me, they're just perfect films to shape of water and Pans. There's, there's not one thing I would change about them. His other films I really love, but there's still aspects of them that I, I'm not 100% on. But The Shape of Water I've watched and panned many a times and there's not one thing I would look at and think, you know what, I'd change a, a scene, anything at all. Uh, they're both perfect in my eyes. I, if I recall correctly, because uh, we did have a sort of watch party and we did we did the sort of prediction of what we wanted, what we think will win. I don't think either of us thought this film would win. Mm, no, no. Yeah, I think it was very much in the middle of our estimations of in terms of what, 
we expected the academy to appreciate so this was a massive surprise but in a good way that was actually that was actually a really good yeah um it was very competitive yeah i think it was just one of those things that i was yeah i think it was when i got yeah darkest hour dunkirk yeah. phantom thread three billboards <laughs> outside ebbin missouri get out the post call me by your name and ladybird so that is yeah quite quite a slew of uh for me there's only one film that would combat it and that's dunkirk which yeah is i expected dunkirk to win that year war film of all time if you want to talk about dunkirk on another episode i'm good to go on that one as well because that is that's great on a humongous screen i watched it at the imax it's just unreal yeah well i mean it's not really up to us if we want to watch dunkirk so let's just hope that the sort of things play out in the future that could happen i was expecting you know what i was actually expecting three blue boards to win that year I, I, I mean, it wasn't like Best Actress, Best Supporting Actor, but I thought it would have been a shoe in for Best don't, Picture. Don't start it, doing that. Well, no, but I think it, it won the BAFTA as well. So it's often that yeah. trap of people saying like, oh, well, it won the BAFTA, so it must win Oscar. Maybe that was it. I think I was just maybe following the trend. And in terms of Shape of Water, like the other ones they won was Best Achievement in Directing. So I guess that's why Del Toro was a lot more talked about there as well. Um Best Achievement in Music, written for Motion Pictures. Uh, Best Achievement in Production Design. And then, yeah, it was nominated pretty much across the board in in uh, every other category. So, um, and Reese, do you remember your first experience watching this? Did you go in expecting, you know, a favourite? Or I didn't watch it in the cinema. I, on, I actually didn't watch it until the beginning of last year. Oh, really? I, okay. I'm not a fan of, of, of love stories. It's not my genre at all. Um, and when I heard the the kind of what it was about it's just something that just didn't really interest me at all and then one day i seen it on amazon i watched it and then i watched it three times in a row and bought the blu-ray with the 4k version literally immediately after and since then in the last 18 months i've probably watched it about 20 times so it's definitely one of those uh, films that made me think well maybe you should just give something a chance rather than just thinking you're not going to like it I'm very happy I gave it a chance on that day. When I said it was a smooth experience, what I meant was I forgot how brisk the film feels. It's two hours long and it just didn't feel it at all. It just went by like incredibly. And just all of it I found upon revisit, just, yeah, I just found it more engaging than I actually remembered because I think David was probably right. This film didn't benefit uh, from me having to watch loads of other films at the time. Uh, when it came out. So I actually was really absorbed by it. I think a couple of elements that I think are probably not going to be discussed. I forgot how good a villain Michael Shannon's character was, mm. especially considering that they, they really, they do a really good job of sort of making him a different kind of misogynist jerk. Mm -hmm. The fact that he seems to fetishize silence in women is something that I think they did a really good job at and just really creepy as well. Um, and the fact that he just sees the story of Samson and Samson and Delilah as one of the as one of his like parables to go back to, I think just the way that they sort of made him incredibly menacing and just just on edge, especially because of the the finger injury and all of the disgusting things that come with that. Um, yeah, I thought that was great. And then obviously uh, Sally Sally Hawkins' uh, performance was also uh, was also fantastic. Um, yeah, and also just forgot how <laughs> how upbeat that character is, and how frankly open she is about a lot of things. I I, f I knew that obviously the you know having sex with the creature was in the film. I for I forgot about all of the earlier scenes just in the bath. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, I think that the world that the film creates is just it's just it's beautiful, and just all of the elements, even though they pack in a lot of different elements, such as, you know, the love aspect, the scientific research, and also elements of the Cold War, I think they actually did a really good job of blending all of those elements together, and just just getting all of these people, especially oh, what's the neighbor's name? Giles. Giles, yeah, that's it. Also, just bringing in his story and just just giving him, like, nice subtle uh, nice subtle development throughout. Um, yeah, I thought it was great. The only thing I will, I will say I actively had to sort of fast forward through because that's the one thing I remembered from the first watch is I I don't be dealing with eating live animals um so yeah I just fast forwarded past that part yeah. and just carried on yeah. um 
I forgot about that bit. And I think I remember again at the cinema kind of being like that moment of like, no, no. Okay, it's probably fine. It's probably a fake yeah. out. Oh, no, it's not a fake also, out. Also, what's hilarious is the name of the cat is Pandora. And I'm like, oh, that's the link to why it was brought up because yeah. of the Avatar episode. Oh, it's because of Pandora. <laughs> it's devouring Pandora. Like this is, I'm the better film. Uh, but yeah, and similar to you in terms of like things I had forgotten how good they are in the film was Octavia Spencer. Like, oh, definitely. Know, the, line where she's just like oh just when you think a man's got nothing down there <laughs> you know he still still comes out so i you know I, I think the performances really do drive this in a lot of ways but they are complemented like you said by just what a complete package it is yeah um, octavia spencer actually had a really good point she said that she appreciated the film in the 1960s where the two main leads are primarily mute because it meant that the majority of do- uh, of dialogue from the sort of protagonist side came from a black woman and a closeted gay man which the perspectives in the 60s usually are ones you wouldn't get. So she thought that was an interesting opportunity. Yeah, very true. And uh, again, a character, I suppose, who's able to have her own agency and sort of stand up for herself. I think years ago in that scene towards the end where um, her husband's just like, oh, this is the person you're looking after, you know, looking for. She would have just sort of accepted it and just warned her friend. But she's like, you know, oh, you don't say anything for all these years. And now you say, you know, I, I love that moment as yeah. well. So uh, Katie, what what is your sort of like uh, summary or, you know, overall thoughts of, of the film what are some of the things you love about it i love the fact that it is film is based in a very harsh time in, in history there's there's racism and there's prejudice and stuff but the, you know i love the fact that it's it encapsulates this sense of escapism you've got this these green visuals that remind me of the matrix but then you then but then you see the little in nuances like you know eliza looking at a pair of red shoes it reminds me of wizard of oz where she's all, which we you know where where Dorothy's also there's also an escape from there. Why what, what I love about this film is that you know yeah, does horror is known for is horror, but this is the most. This is not as terrifying as his other films like Chronos, for instance. Um, it, it's such a and and you've got this endearing protagonist in the centre who doesn't who isn't hindered. She's not. She's not brought down by her disability. She's got a character. She. This character has character. Um, you know, she, where she was able to sign Fuck you to to, the, to 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 Michael Shannon's character. I think. Yeah, that's what. And going back to your original point is that you know, at the centre of it, you've got a, a gay man and a black woman and a mute woman that is just fighting against this very white. Dom- male dominated society no offense but it's just like <laughs> and 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 they and you know they have they have moral morals and stuff but at the end of the day it's just such a tender love story that she does she kind of that she it doesn't matter the fact that they're different species and stuff there there's a connection there and she's she's willing to embrace it not to mention the fact they're also joined by a communist who would have been treated in the same vein as all of those other groups at the time yeah i think that um that was something I thought as well was just the fact that each of these characters have their own agency and they're not defined by um, certain traits or disabilities that they have. Like like you said, Katie, that, you know, they are characters in themselves. And again, it's not even like they're sort of adding a cheesiness to it in terms of saying like this is, you know, their, their sort of superpower or anything like that. You know, they don't need to have this moment in which, you know, the fact that she's, you know, mute sort of helps her in any way yeah she does get that great moment with michael shannon which that comes you know to her advantage but you know and i think obviously it makes her a more kind of like uh sympathetic character and you know sort of like listens to people a lot so she definitely has her strengths that come from that but again you just don't you don't watch the film thinking like oh you know she is just the mute character it's all about the fact that she is mute she's still got like a lot of depth to her, and i think that that's the same uh, for for all the characters and even the villain, I think that that's what fascinates me and did strike out to me when I first saw it. But like Craig, I almost, I I did forget how big a part Michael Shannon's role is because I think to have a really effective film, especially when you have a sort of hero and villain esque story, then your villain has to be just as interesting as your hero. And I you know I always appreciate films that are able to spend just as much time on those characters as they are their heroes and and in some ways sometimes i feel it almost is michael shannon's sort of like film and story about his comeuppance uh more so because there's so many scenes that which are like this is what this guy is about this is what's driving driving him this is what is giving him this kind of like complex which i think 
is is really interesting. Uh, so, Reese, what is it about this film that makes it, you know, one of your favorites and, and stands out to you so much and, and has made you rewatch it so many times as well? Yeah, there, there, there's so many things. One of the reasons why I watched it three times in a row is because I just had to focus on so many different things. Initially, it was the story itself, the, the love story. Um, obviously, everyone's already mentioned how many different types of people there are. You've got the mute, the black lady, the closeted gay guy. And it's kind of, there's so many different types of people represented in the movie. Um, and in all different type of ways, they're all looked at in a certain type of way because of, of one thing rather than who they are as people. Um, and overall, the story is basically just showing that every single person deserves love, no matter if you've got any things which the normal run-of-the-mill people would look at as a deficiency. Um, everyone deserves love in the end, and I think that's the main thing that I took from the story itself. And then when I rewatched it, I can kind of start taking in the production design, which is just absolutely incredible from start to finish. The cinematography, the, everything about this movie, I I just think it's a perfect movie. No matter how many times I go back and watch it, I pick up on another minute detail. The opening credits, for instance, where the shape of water comes in, um, when you go in and look at a deep dive of how they filmed it with practical effects and everything, it's just absolutely insane. The amount of detail they go to for every single shot. Um, and it's just such a tender a tender film and i think sally hawkins is superb every single person in it is like you said with michael shannon he's such a a crazy character and he's always given off that kind of vibe to me in movies like the iceman even in in eight mile he's kind of seems unhinged at times and i think they gave him a lot of depth the scene when he goes back to the the house with his wife is is pretty intense and just kind of shows who he is as a character um but no overall from start to finish i, I just love this film I'm starting to think that Michael Shannon might actually just be one of my favorite actors just because of everything he does is so unhinged. I'm, I'm not sure if anyone remembers this, but years ago, uh, College Humor got him to do a recital um, of a, an email sent out by, a, by a, um, a sorority leader to their entire sorority, just calling them out for their uh, inappropriate behavior. And that inappropriate behavior being things like going off and partying with footballers they shouldn't be and just, you know, just enjoying themselves. And just the way he does it is beautifully over the top. I was get, I was thinking that as well throughout the day. I was like, I, you know, you, you know you're in for a good sort of performance, at least when you see him in a film. And even though I have my problems with things like Man of Steel, you know, I do absolutely love his performance, even in that film as well. I think, you know... Oh, yeah, I hated his character writing, but I think the way he actually does yeah, it is quite good. But again, it's, even some of his lines I did still enjoy. Like, I, maybe it is just the way that he performs it, saves it a bit, but, you know... No, I mean what they actually do with the character oh, yeah, in the yeah, film. Okay, yeah. But I, I always loved his, like, line where... Um, Russell Crowe's character, you know, Superman's dad is kind of like, you know, this is, you know, Madness Sod and, you know, like... And then he like turns to him and he's like, yes, and I'm, you know, arguing it's, um, you know, morals with a ghost. You know, I'm ar arguing the morals with a ghost. Loving the line delivery, David. Yeah. Really selling them a scene. <laughs> I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, he's definitely exactly. got a great, a great voice and a great tempo when putting across lines for sure. And Man is still, it is a very poor script, but he even makes some of the scenes fairly bearable, which is good. Yeah, I think it's just his conviction that he says everything with. That's what I love about that line is that, you know, he, you know, puts... You just, you, you fully understand the psychology of his characters. And I think that that is what is interesting about his character here. Um, that obviously it makes that, you know, the purposeful effort to show so many aspects of his life about why he's doing what he's doing um, and having this sort of like God complex almost. And I think that's what's quite interesting about the end of the film is that, you know, by him sort of like admitting like, oh, you know, you are a god, you know, like that, that moment. Um, because I think the scene with like the general, I find very interesting as well. Literally just the way he's saying that, just like, you know, you will exist in this parallel universe in which you were a loser and, you know, just like berating him like that. But then so many times throughout the film, the fact that he just has this kind of expectation on himself to apply dominance as much as he can, you know, with the stick and the fact that I love the, like you said, Reese, there's so much great aspects technically about this film which you can focus on. I love the emphasis they put on, you know, him placing the the sort of baton all the time when it's like that big thud whenever and whenever he lifts it, you know, you kind of feel the weight of that weapon and, and then when he uses it on people and on on the creature it's you know kind of harrowing to see and you know that very much 
he's kind of enjoying that kind of torture, he, you know, he, he applies there. Uh, Katie, any other sort of standouts in terms of performances I, or from Michael Shannon? No, I was uh, actually going to just uh, talk about Michael Stuhlbarg because I love him. <laughs> he's such a great actor. And I think he said, I think it, this was them, him in this as well as Call Me By Your Name with two of his like most standout performances in, in my mind because here he's like, here has so much to to take on he's so much to so much pressure on him because you know he's got commitments to his to his country but also to here he has to try and hide his his um identity as well as keeping the asset the creature alive there's so much on his plate but he doesn't he doesn't cave under the pressure he has this really calm yet compassionate demeanor and it's and when so when he started to get wind about Eliza's plans and stuff, he noticed that something's not off, off. He doesn't think twice about helping her, which shows that you know, yeah, he's got you know he may be you know playing for the wrong side, but it doesn't mean that he doesn't have a heart. It doesn't mean that he doesn't care about this this creature that he you know he he can see that he's learning from he's he can see that there's something behind that something more than just was on the outside and I think that's just a perfect metaphor of what what's what's in this, about this film about these characters. His CV is is absolutely insane. I had a look at it earlier, and I definitely think Stolberg is one of the the characters in it that can show that people can change and that everyone's viewpoints doesn't need to stay the same throughout. And if you've got an idea of the way people are, you can change. Um, and I thought that was a tremendous character and he's one of the best character actors working today. Um, I, every time his name is on a cast list, I can't wait to see what he does. Interesting. Actually, he was in the post and call me by your name. So he was in three nominated films from that Oscar year, which I guess shows also he knows it's like in, in any way any way shape or form he's going to get on that stage for something <laughs> but for call me by your name that's that that monologue he did that, that made me cry oh god it was it was just one of those perfect speeches that you i thought it it didn't i thought it would go cheesy and sentimental but it didn't he has a lot of sincerity as an actor and I think that, you know, he's able to kind of bring that kind of like opposite to Michael Shannon in a way, I guess, that he's and that was what's kind of great is that they kind of have that face off at the end because I think throughout the film, sometimes you think like, well, what's the purpose of this character? Is it purely to be the character which will help her out in the end or who will give away the, you know, the location? But I don't think it comes off as simple as that. And I think it's like you said, Katie, because he's also a part of the story in the way that he's hiding something about himself and, you know, has got, you know, complexities uh, within himself as well in terms of like reflecting also that kind of Cold War storyline as well. Um, but also the way that Del Toro uses him, I think, you know, with the visuals, as you were saying earlier, Reese, that moment in which he saw comes out of the shadows and so realizes that she has this connection to the the creature i think that that is one of the very kind of old school kind of hollywood very like visual moments of like you know like coming out of the shadows and you know i think that he he plays that well you know the sort of theatrics of it as well which you know goes well into the kind of visuals you see throughout this movie i think that this is one that you see a lot i think i always remember the shot of you know, the rain, raindrops on the window. I think that was always used in maybe one of the cinema adverts or something like that, where he was talking about how he loves cinema or maybe like sky movies or something. It was used in one of those sort of adverts. But it is one of those films that can kind of use a lot of its kind of key visual moments uh, to kind of just wow you, I guess, as well. And also give it a kind of a visual aesthetic is, you know, that kind of green, <laughs> you no know, coming out a lot. Uh uh, you know what what are the standards for you Reese as you said before you know uh, the fact that you can watch it just for its cinematography do you think of the I guess for me I would sort of think as well of the kind of old school approach to it in terms of like all the the 50s dials and buttons and the the location that they're in in terms of the base but but also the, all the classic Hollywood theater and all of that kind of stuff yeah there, there's so many finer details that go into it and there, there's so many things that if you look at everything it's just so well done and the production design side of things everything is just so on point i'm not the best for noticing 
kind of clues to how people are influenced by other films. So sometimes there could be a certain scene, a bit of dialogue, or maybe a visual aspect, which is coming from another film. And if someone points it out, I can normally spot it. But there's so many times that people are like, did you spot that? Did you spot that? And, and normally I'm so focused on the actual film itself. Like Tarantino, for instance, his films are just all over the place. You've got so many different things from other films. So I'm intrigued to hear what you guys think and if there's anything you think he's taken from other films and, and where they come up. Well, I think that's where it's used well is, is when, like Tarantino, again, it doesn't attract you from the story when it isn't like, you know, uh, the Wilhelm scream or something like that in which you like, it's a known thing like, oh yeah, I know what that is. It's And as you said earlier, Katie, like the red shoes, etc. It, it's not something like, because it, they're not exactly the same. That it's not like shot in the exact same way. It's not like she's clicking her heels together or anything like that. So that there's those kind of like subtle references there. And I guess even the film itself, the you know the creature's design. You know, you've got creature the Black Lagoon, which goes to those kind of creature feature vibes. And even I suppose the actual classic movies shown throughout this. So I definitely would say that this film feels right that del toro won the oscar for it because it is his love letter to cinema and we all know the oscars kind of loves to acknowledge its own history and kind of reward films that kind of look back at at the past and kind of comment on art and and filmmaking uh, in itself so i think it's a really nice film that kind of combines the two without going like oh this is a story about hollywood like la la land or something or like Mank, this is something that's able to combine the two. And it's just by coincidence, I guess, that she lives above a theater. There's nothing really else in the story, which is like, oh, it's about films or like influence. But it's just that kind of natural aspect that her and Giles kind of watch movies together. And she has like the dancing, like that's one of my favorite moments as well, is when they do the tap dance with the their legs, um, when they're sort of like bumping along. Um, it's just such a sweet, tender moment. I love their friendship throughout it. And I think that that's one of the the moments that, you know, really depict that. K- KD, what are some standouts for you in terms of its uh, visuals or cinematography? One of the scenes that I remember is when she starts to sing and it fades into the black and white dance scene because it, it reminded me of not only like the artist, but because she spends whole the whole film being quiet. And when she finally starts to realise her feelings towards the creature are more than just, it's, it's, more, it's deeper than love. And she can actually fantasize about singing and dancing with him like, like, she, like he's some other guy. And that was just the sweetest moment, in my, in my opinion. Yeah, that's a, definitely an example of, again, me watching it and being like, oh, I forgot this was in it. So even though, like we've said, that there's those moments like the opening, uh, the sort of like moment where, you know, her and the creature sort of like spinning in the water in the bathroom, etc. The raindrops on the window. There's so many visual moments. But then watching that bit, I was like, oh, yeah. And there's this as well. There's this reference. There's this kind of like nod to classic Hollywood. So, yeah, it's really filled with stuff. And I guess it's like you said earlier, Craig, it, it kind of goes with the smooth pace of the film as well. Yeah, although that was one of the most iconic scenes for me. I am ashamed that you forgot it. Mm. <laughs> well, forgot yeah, it. There's so in. many. There is there is so many in the film, and that's why when everyone says anyone says they don't like it, I I just don't. I just can't see how you can watch this film and just not absolutely love it. Maybe the whole creature type of thing and the, the, this a woman having sex with a creature is a bit weird for some people, but I some of the people that say they don't like it, I'm sure they haven't even watched the film and they just took it out of context and, and think it's one thing because it's just so much here to love about it. I, I, it's, it's a film that I'll fight to for the death. To I think it, I think it benefits from multiple viewings. I mean, I think it, I definitely took in more than watching it, watching it now rather than watching it at nine thirty in the morning when I'm shattered but uh, um, yeah, I think I think Reese is right. There's so much detail and there's so much to enjoy in this. It's just a lot. Yeah, it might just it, you know the context and the plot and certain elements may not sit well with people, but it doesn't. You can't deny that it's, it's stunning to watch. Yeah, I'm I'm intrigued as to what negatives there are out there. Again, I I guess maybe it's the sort of expectation element of it, and there's the the weight of it being an Oscar winner that a lot of people might go in expecting a certain type of film, which 
I guess it would be a bit dumb because the entire poster kind of in, in suggests it's a love story just from the sort of like, you know, embracing, but whether people kind of expect something a bit more horror-esque or creepy, um, I don't know. But I think something like Parasite, for example, is something that maybe is very artistic and has got a lot to say, but people could still go in and kind of be thrown by, but still engaged with and kind of enjoy just for maybe you know, the violence or the the visuals or the kind of dynamic story, whereas this is much more of a gentle kind of like nuanced story. And I guess it's just whether people like, you know, appreciate or respect that. I also just think that the trait, because I vividly remember the trailer for this film. I actually think the trailer sets this film up perfectly. Mm. Um, So I just don't understand if people were going in with a certain expectation, what that expectation is. The only thing I could find on online is that people arbitrarily, this is, I think, the most arbitrary thing. I've made jokes about it throughout the episode. Uh, apparently, a significant number of allurophiles, aka cat lovers, detest the film and just because there's a cat eaten. I'm like, right. Okay, see, that makes come sense. On. Most people, when you're discussing it, you don't really seem to get an idea of what they don't like about it. I'm very easily, I love dogs, I love cats, I love all animals, but anything on screen, I can kind of take it as it being on screen in a, in a film. I've never looked at anything. That's why I can watch the, the worst horror movies of all time. All these movies, that everyone says you can only watch once or you should never watch. They did like martyrs, for instance, that's one of the most gruesome films there is. But for me, it just doesn't really bother me in that kind of way. I've never looked at a film and kind of thought of it in a humanized way. I kind of take it as a an art form rather than uh, real life. So I've never had a problem with that myself. Yeah. And I think it's the context in which it happens. I think because even the film itself, you know, doesn't glorify the death or anything that, you know, the owner himself kind of is upset by it and sort of like, you know, under, you know, then says that I understand, you know, he's a monster, but then he even sort of like makes light of the situation with the other cats, you know, by saying like, oh, you know, lucky it wasn't you. But also then that you see then the creature later, you know, petting them and sort of, you know, getting, getting used to them. So there's, it's used for a moment of character growth as well. There's a bit of the kind of like horror-esque element to it as well. It's all about growth, right? And the reason why he eats the cat and doesn't eat the cats further down the line, because he finds out that eating the cat is not right. And sometimes people have a an, an inbuilt, idea of of what's right and wrong so there's there's so many different aspects in in the movie the racism the sexism the misogyny there's so many different things which people are brought up in a certain way and believe that that is right and until you've been told no no, this is not what you're meant to do this is not the right way to go it's hard for people to change and i think that's why that scene is in the movie because even though this character is seen as a as a monster um he is seen as a divine type of creature, like a God, right? That can do no wrong. So they had to show in some way, shape or form that no, he's not perfect. He just doesn't understand the way things are meant to be. And it's another way of showing that every character in the movie is allowed to change. And it's the same way with, with people in real life, but that's how I took it anyway. Giles's apartment, I think is really, you know, a, a great set as well to have all those paintings, to have those kind of like layers there to it and to have that theme of green as well. And uh, that's why I love as well. There plays a part of the film that like Michael Shan's character. I like that scene where, as you were saying earlier, Katie, about like, you know, the time that this film was set and it's very much taking you into that moment when the salesman is just there, like literally on a spinning wheel. And he's just there as like a walking advertisement, almost like, you know, one in uh, five Americans, is like, you know, successful people have a Cadillac. Da, da, da. And, uh, you know, he's like, oh, it's green. He's like, it's teal. And again, and that symbolism to the creature itself, which is almost like the same color, um, I just think is really interesting. And, and I think that that use of like the color green and blues and the fact that you see it in so many places in the film, but it's not necessarily just, oh, the creature is green. You know, he's quite a sort of complex design to him. But the fact that you've got like Michael Shannon will have those like green sweets all the time. Um, you know, the fact that Eliza's, you know, quite often sort of dressed in those colors, the the facility itself. And it's kind of all used to kind of give you that sort of eerie, you know, old school sci-fi vibes, but also kind of giving it this, own texture i guess in the way of like you know the the swamp water is almost as if this is the space in which the creature and eliza are safe because at the end of it they're kind of in this green murky water and at the beginning you see this kind of green murky sort of like 
sea house um i guess that kind of like adds to the kind of like this is the dream world this is the you know the the perfect world in which this these two characters exist which i think works really well Okay, so grab your cassettes and rewind them again, because it's time for VHS Corner. So, a couple of things. Let's start with uh, Gilmero del to- de- mm. Let's start with Gilmero... Uh, oh, for God's <laughs> sake. Let's start with Del Toro. <laughs> yeah, we'll leave that in. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's, oh, it's all good, it's all good. Let's start with Sally Hawkins. Because obviously she's a big part of this film and a big draw. Um, specifically, Del Toro said about uh, a lot of this film was specifically written with her in mind, specifically for uh, the lead role. Um, he said not only was she the first choice, she was the only choice. He also wrote the movie for Michael Shannon with that role in mind as well. But the reason he specifically wanted Sally Hawkins, because he said, I wanted the character of Alyssa to be beautiful in her own way, not in a way that is like a perfume commercial kind of way, that you could believe that this character, this woman would be sitting next to you on the bus, but at the same time, she would have a luminosity, a beauty, almost magical, ethereal. Um, so the way that he approached her, well, he first met her in 2014 at the Golden Globes and pitched her the film whilst he was intoxicated. He says, I was drunk and not... A- uh, and it's not a movie that makes you sound less drunk. And to be fair, she put a lot into that uh, into that film. Probably my favourite fact about her working production is after completing one of the demanding underwater scenes in the films, they are some of my favourite scenes in the film as well, um, she then flew over to London to pre- uh, begin production work on Paddington 2, only to find out that she would have to shoot underwater scenes for the first first day that she arrived to do it. So a lot of water in Sally's life. So Del Toro, um, what he did as well to produ- uh, to basically provide as much characterization for the characters as possible is that he wrote lengthy backstories for each of the major characters, uh, some of them reportedly running over 40 pages long. Um, and after casting all of the roles, he offered them to the actors and said that they could choose to use them or ignore the backstories uh, for the character. Um so Richard Jenkins, uh, he completely ignored it, saying the only thing that matters is what happens on the screen. Um, while Michael Stolberg said he read the backstory uh, vicariously and found it helpful in his performance. So we've been talking... So obviously this film meant a lot to Del Toro. He began working on the film in 2011. So what he did to actually start it, he self-financed a crew that designed both the creature and the laboratory. So obviously those are the two design elements that we really appreciated and those were the earliest things developed. Um, it was a good thing that worked out uh, worked out for him because in terms of every best picture winner, um, The Shape of Water is the top grossing best picture winner in five, five years, grossing over 194 million US dollars worldwide on a budget of 19 million. Uh, David mentioned earlier that the creature design is heavily inspired by Creature from the Black Lagoon. Uh, Michael Shannon's character even says that they picked up the uh, the specimen or whatever you want to call it uh, in the Amazon River in South America, which is the setting of, cre- of the creature from that film. Uh, the genesis of the idea for the film began um, from the 1954 classic film uh, with Del Toro saying, I thought it would be great if uh, if a creature and Julie Adams, who plays Kay Adams in the film, would end up living together. I was six, I didn't know better, but I'm 53 and I still don't know better because I made this movie, he laughed. So obviously we've had, we talked a lot about our reactions. I think we've all said that we love this film. Uh, I think there's a couple of other notable uh, reactions that I found that I thought I would just tell to you guys. After seeing the trailer, Kevin Smith tweeted, seeing something as beautiful as this makes me feel stupid for ever calling myself a director. Wow. Which is a very strong reaction. And according to Seth Rogen on a podcast episode, uh, How Did This Get Made? He drunkenly told uh, Del Toro at a party that if the creature had shown his penis, it would have been the best movie of the year. Del Toro disagreed. <laughs> I did also find out why they use the color green, but I decided to uh, to leave it out despite David. So, oh, thanks. <laughs> so yeah, and that is VHS corner for this week. Something that that did remind me of as well was what I was going to say, and you mentioned it at the beginning as well, in just the the shock of 
those scenes of uh, Eliza in the bath, etc., is how big a part sex is a part of the film, but not again in a kind of like showy, like, oh, look how, you know, shocking this is. It kind of, again, is showing the workings of our characters, especially in the you know juxtaposition of Shannon's character and Sally Hawkins's character. But uh, that's where I think it's, yeah, interesting that even in terms of them like joking about the penis and stuff like that, that people's reactions to it is very much, some people will have the reaction similar to what we were talking about last week with Avatar, like, oh yeah, that's the movie where the girl has sex with a fish. But I think that for a film to then prove that kind of like simple ideology wrong is what makes it so much better as well. I think that there are films out there in which they're like, oh, hey, that's the film in which this character does this like dumb thing or which, uh, you know, the weird tail sex Pandora thing, you know, happens. And, you know, that Avatar does somewhat of a decent job of kind of like explaining it in a way and not making it just about that. But I think this film, again, you watch it and it, you just overcome that. You're just like, yeah, you you completely sort of understand it and stand it within its world. It doesn't sort of take you out of it. You aren't just immediately like, oh, this is stupid. This is goofy. It's kind of the charm and the, you know, the world that uh, Del Toro takes you into. So interesting as well that directors had those, you know, reactions to it and, and kind of see it for, you know, how, how beautiful it is in that sense. Two things. She went from The Shape of Water to Paddington 2, <laughs> which is just absolutely ridiculous to absolutely amazing films. And then just talking about him writing the film for Sally Hawkins, I watched uh, Layer Cake the other day and noticed that Sally Hawkins is actually in that, playing a English gangster woman who screams and shouts with an AK and it just blew my mind considering how sweet she is in this film. She's got and range. how well-spoken she is when she, she's so well-spoken when you hear in interviews that when I watched the layer cake the other day and seen her pop up, it kind of blew my mind that she would play that role. Um, so yes, she definitely has some range and they would, they would, that was the two things that came to my mind. What I find more hilarious is that he basically said that he cast her because he thought of her as like a conventional beauty, which I think, yeah, fair enough. But the sort of detail of just like, just to be clear, not like Hollywood, not like Hollywood hot, etc. And just the amount of detail. It's just like, basically you're saying, I cast you because you're hot. Not that hot though. Oh. Um, let's just be clear. It reminds me, that's why it also reminds me of Amelie. It's like, you know, in that, in, in that mm. film, there was like that scene where the love interest is like saying, oh, is this girl... Emily pretty and you know the photographs say oh she's she's not bad she's not bad and the only one one of them says oh she's beautiful and they said no 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 she's pretty no this is beautiful so it's that but she is that that kind of appearance of that yeah she is beautiful but she's not the kind of beautiful that's like they'll just make people stop and stare they'll notice her but it's not like something that it's like it's like a memorable beauty in a way it's not over, it's not intimidating if that makes sense i did think of amelie watching this as well actually that kind of like you know we were talking about the influences of it as well is that kind of like classic hollywood and horror but also that kind of like foreign cinema influence there as well of kind of having like feeling like you're almost watching like a you know a french film or something without it actually being french but but yeah, I, I do enjoy when Sally Hawkins is able to p- play these range of characters because when I do think of her, I think of her as these, you know, I think she was in Submarine. Uh, she was also, I think, in that recent, uh, is it The Phantom of the Open, etc. So she does seem to have created a niche for herself in in that respect. But, but yeah, you're also right, Reese, that she sometimes plays completely different characters. And I think she she brings it every single time. I think even... I always remember as well, even in the Godzilla film, she doesn't have much of a role in that. She doesn't do an awful lot, but for what is quite a simple and basic character, you know, I was quite bummed out when they killed her off as well in in King of the Monsters. Spoilers for that film. Spoiler but, alert. Yeah, sorry. Um, but I think that even as a kind of like, I'm just the scientist character, she brings a lot more to to her roles than, you know, what would be expected of, of that other actors. I remember her from um, Maiden Dagenham. I and a little bit of a, I I couldn't I couldn't watch all of it for one reason it just didn't really sit well with me and but Happy Go Lucky as well I think that was the film that kind of made made her. 
Right, so we'll uh, wrap up our discussion about the film now by going to our movie vault uh, by asking, does The Shape of Water deserve to be remembered for all time and gain the honour of a place in our movie vault? Uh, So this is our vault of movies in which we want certain films to be remembered and honoured for all time for different reasons. The fact they won an Oscar doesn't necessarily make it a given, um, but it's whether if you know, there was only this vault of movies left in the world and somebody was to come across it, do you think that this would be an important movie for them to sort of learn from or to kind of enjoy or witness? I think I already know the the answer from Reese. <laughs> uh, but Yeah, 100% is my answer. It definitely deserves to go in the vault. Uh, yourself, Katie, what do you think? And now a bit on the fence. I, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a great film, but I was like, when you think about creature features... Mm. I'm not sure if it's the most memorable. It's not the most, you know, one that would be a defining one in that genre. So I'm a bit on the fence. Yeah, that's true. Um, Craig, what what do you think? Well, I'm just going to go against this, it, against the grain that we've been developing because it's, frankly, it stopped us from putting films that I think should be in there. I think at the point where we just all agree this is an exceptional film, I don't care about what it represents in the tropes or whether this is like Del Toro's best best film, I think it is going to be the film that he's recognised by a significant amount of people for for a long time, at which point has nothing to necessarily do with his directing standards. It's just because it's genuinely exceptional. I just think put it in. Yeah, yeah, I get, yeah, I definitely, I can see what you mean, Katie, and being on the fence. And I think if you look at it in that lens of saying about, you know, it, it does it represent Oscar winning films best or creature films best etc then yeah perhaps not and even by our own admittance i guess the fact that some of us didn't remember this as one of the most memorable oscar wins but i think the feeling is but by everyone having such a great time re-watching this that it didn't so like get worse or like uh, you know less memorable and the fact that it is such a love letter to cinema I think, again, if somebody was to watch this, then you would just sort of learn so much about what works about a simple story or from uh, cinematography, visuals, um, sort of interesting, complex, diverse characters. Um, I do think it is is a shoe in uh, to go in. So, I mean, we've all said that this film benefits from rewatch anyway. Yeah. I If that's the case, I don't think we should be... I don't think we should punish a film for you know not going through it the first time because there are lots of films where you have to go through it a second time in order to really feel that impact look at stories that rely on you you know reevaluating the entirety of the film because of a twist at the end mm. for example do you think we've run one new round katie <laughs> yeah yeah you could you could say that <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean i did say myself that it benefits from multiple viewings so yeah yeah i just put it in <laughs> <laughs> right into the movie vault then goes the shape of water from 2017 directed by gilmero del toro let us know at home do you agree uh do you think that there are you know better sort of examples to go into the movie vault of the different genres or of oscar winners and please let us know at home what you would like to see discussed or potentially go into the vault in the future but now we go to our ever fun end game we're in the end game now Okay, end game time. So this game is simply just called No Evil. Because what I think a lot of people gravitate to this film for is their portrayal of a of a mute character. And it got me thinking about um a lot of char- uh, a lot of characters within cinema um or should I say the few of them that exist uh of characters who are mute, but also then got me thinking about other disabilities such as say uh, like being deaf or being blind, which made me think of the parable, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. So I thought, that sounds like a premise for a game. So what I've done is I've taken a couple of characters from various films. Um, basically, I've just got their name, and I want you, in a quick fire, to basically say, is this character mute, blind, or deaf? So even if you've never heard of the character, you've basically got a one in three chance of being right. Uh, And it's quite simple. If you get it right, you get a point. If you don't, you don't. Uh, I will need some help scoring with this one. So David, if you'd be able to do the scoring. So what is it that we're playing for? As usual, we are playing for the opportunity to choose the next film for the episode. But there is a difference. 
As we're gearing up for a summer break, we've decided we actually want, in order to bridge the gap left by our holidays, uh, we are asking um, our guests, as well as David, to prepare not one, but two films for the upcoming two episodes. So this isn't going to be just two random films I want to discuss. We actually want them to be an actual bridge. So that's why we're asking everyone for a film and its sequel. So the choices that will be on offer today are either David's, Katie's or Reese's. So David, give us an idea of what your films would be. Uh, so my films are from 2012 and 2013 uh, and it's dealing, I think, with some of the same sort of subject matter and genres uh, as we kind of went from Avatar to this film, I think, going from this film uh, to this sets of films. While it's not directly the same sort of, like, story or themes, I think there's definitely elements of, like, rebellion in there. There's uh, fact, you know, the fact that a lot of characters uh, within this sort of franchise are sort of mentally and physically scarred and then you know so sort of looking into the the idea of uh rebellion um and just kind of taking on those sort of darker tones and as we've seen with del toro that he can still be someone who goes into franchise fear but doesn't do it in a kind of stereotypical way so i think that uh you know these are quite sort of interesting films for the kind of like themes that they bring up um and based off you know very famous books as well um and the kind of like performances that we get from them all sort of stand out as well okay fantastic and I've, and for the first time ever i think i've worked out what it is you're <laughs> suggesting okay then so for the next suggestions katie uh my choices are from 2004 and 2008 um they're very very visually rich features um they 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 feature an ensemble cast, most of which are in both films, and um, they and I don't want to ruin it, say anything else before uh, before I spoil it. So that's all you're gonna all I'm gonna say. Okay, some sometimes simplicity is key, as we've already discussed with the story from uh, today, uh, and then finally, Reese. So I didn't actually write down the year of the movies cool so they came out at some I, point <laughs> they come out at some point um anything that i could probably say is probably going to give away what the movies are so we'll just have to wait and see what my picks are if i win i guess because anything i say is probably going to give away what they are and i don't want to spoil the cool surprise. so i i compliment in simplicity and reese ran with it <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, and I love exactly. how the film's got more and more mysterious as we went along. Like mine was like, you know, it was like, oh, you know, good chunk of details, a few details, no details. <laughs> Why whilst everyone was saying their own, I was trying to think in my head, what could I say that gives a hint to this film without giving it away? Yeah. And everything. Okay, are there are so there any easy. actors who are shared potentially? There's one of the actor, yeah, one of the actors is, is shared. There we Actually, go. One of the actors is shared. There we go. There's some connection. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so Basically, what I want for this is if you think you know the answer, I want you to just say me. So let's test that out because people have struggled with this in the past. Uh, Katie, can you say me? Me. Reese. Me. Fantastic. They sound completely different, so I will be able to. I will be able to pick you out. <laughs> um, like I said, it's essentially just a one in three. Um, depending on how. F Actually, if you can also just if you have an idea of what film it is, feel free to say. Uh, I will tell you what the films are at the end. Are there any bonus points? Eh, we'll, we'll see. One thing I'll say is the disclaimer, in case anyone uh, is a nitpicking fan um, and will message me about this. All of these characters have been taken from various articles that have been listed that have listed these characters under these free uh, under these free disabilities. For blindness, they have counted temporary blindness in some situations. So one of the suggestions on an article was Han Solo. I decided not to include that. <laughs> However, other characters... Star Wars. Yeah, you're not getting bonus points for the film. That's fine. <laughs> With regards to mute, uh, this is both psychological muteness as well as physical muteness. So... For some characters, it might just be they, they have taken the vow of silence that they've never broken. For others, it might be they have literally, uh, literally just cannot speak uh, because of physical conditions, such as, such as say, as Liza's characters, her vocal cords were stripped. Um, again, if, any, if there are any pedanticness, 
I will deal with it. But if you're going to come at me, come at me nicer than the people who came after David. <laughs> when you say, I thought you were going to say a different F word when you said like pedantic fans. I thought you were honestly going to just, you know, be, I was like, wow, this is harsh. <laughs> anyway, enough preamble. Let's start. Are we ready? Ready. Okay. Yeah. So remember, all I'm asking for is are they deaf, mute, or blind? First character. Reagan Abbott. Me. Reese. Deaf. This is where I've got to awkwardly flip over apps now. <laughs> are they deaf? Hey. Do you know what the film is by any chance? I don't. I I don't have a clue. I just thought, why not go uh, one in three chance? Okay, fair enough. Uh, did you uh, did you get any closer to what the film might have been, Katie? No, I was just thinking okay. what it was. I can't. It was um. Uh, so they are indeed the deaf character. They are the child in a quiet place. Ah, yeah. Ah. That's yeah, the that's thing. These kind of I characters know. are difficult with names. That yeah, that's have... the f- that's the thing. I would point out if if some of these names are unrecognizable, blame the Hollywood system for not promoting more of these characters. Yeah, I know the actor's name. I just didn't know the, the character's name, but maybe 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 my subconscious was telling me I'm right. Okay, character number two. Boo Radley. Me. Katie? Guessing here, uh, mute. Ooh. Yeah, I yep. like. <laughs> They are, uh, that is the character who is um, pre- uh, predominantly in the shadows uh, and doesn't speak because of psychological reasons from To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh. Is it almost like people were kind of basing it off like their names, be like, oh, that sounds like a character that might have this... Uh, so disability, I guess, from the way that sometimes characters like that are written. Like well, if that's the given. if that's the case, have fun with this next one. Are you ready for number three? Get ready for this one. Blinking. Me. Katie. Blind. Yeah, they're blind. <laughs> Robin Hood men in tights. So okay, so so far, every, points have been scored for every answer. That I'm impressed. Number four, Mister Cotton. Me. Katie? Mute. Wow. He is mute. Do you know who he is? Pirates of the Caribbean. Yes, indeed he is from Pirates of the Caribbean. And I've because of that, I've actually decided, if you get the film, bonus points. Yeah. Yay! So, okay. Which character is that? I'm trying to think. It's the pirate. That's what I'm thinking in my the head. The, that's the, the one with the parrot. The one oh, with the parrot yes. who does yeah, all the communications yeah. for him. Yeah. His cunt. His yeah. His cung. His tongue has been cut out. <laughs> Number five. Sarah Norman. Me. Reese. Blind. Are they blind? Ah. Uh. Unfortunate. They are indeed. Death. They're from Children of a Lesser God. Next up, we have Susie Hendricks. Me. Reese? Mute. You're going mute? Yeah. They are blind. Blind from oh, Suspiria, blind time, right? Um, oh, uh, the one that I've got is Wait Until Dark. Oh, okay. I thought it was, it was another character called Susie who's, whose eyes were... Okay. It doesn't matter if she's blind if you've got to wait till the dark. <laughs> okay. Next up. Matt Murdock. Me. Me. Katie, that oh. was Katie was Blind. Blind. That's it. Yeah, geez, it would be that one, wouldn't yep. it? What's the film? Daredevil. Oh. Yep. And that is one of when I said said this game to David, that is one of two suggestions he sent me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that that one was a yeah. Okay. This next one is going to be, I think, the most surprising of the list. The Sandman. <gasps> I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Me. Katie? I'm guessing you're deaf. He is oh. mute. Yeah. David, what's uh, the film? Uh, Led. Legends of the Guardians or Guardians Oh, you oh yeah. come on, Dave. How do you not know Rise of the Guardians? The There's so many of those Guardian uh, films. Like No, there are this literally in, no films with Guardians in the name, you know, Guardians of Gahul and all that kind of stuff. 
So yeah, this is the most probably the most controversial one. He never speaks throughout the film and uses sand to actually communicate with other characters. So he's on a list of uh, popular mute characters. Can I consider mute? I don't know. I would like to take that one. Okay. Next up. Ada McGrath. Me. Katie? Mute. Do you know the film? The Piano. It is indeed The Piano. Oh. <laughs> I'm feeling like Reese from... The Reese is me from last week. <laughs> from last that, that's not. That's not fair. He scored a point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> apart from Matt Murdock. Who, yeah. yeah, you're doing better than... Matt Murdock. You're doing better than me, Reese. Have that. <laughs> that's, that's the good thing. No, I don't, honestly, I'm, I'm terrible with stuff like that, but we'll, we'll keep going. Okay. The next... Hence why I keep jumping over. Sorry. No, that's all good. It's <laughs> all good. So the next one... Is Joe the foster father? Me. Katie? He is deaf. He is deaf? Baby driver. Oh, wow. <laughs> yep. That that's is, incredible. That's some knowledge right there. Remember, Katie, <laughs> they, have... they don't give him a surname, so I just have to call him the foster father. I was just going to go, go with Joe, and I thought uh, that would be a bit harsh. I thought that was the character's yeah. name. Joe, you say it all day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now onto a character which is actually just one one word. Hattie. Me. Reese. Deaf. Are they deaf? They are mute. They're a film from a film called Sweet and Lockdown. I can imagine after two years of it, the words we would never combine in the sentence <laughs> yeah. are sweet and lockdown. Yeah. yeah. No. Okay, next up. Alexis Winton. Me. Katie? Uh, I'm guessing here, blind? Oh. Oh. Yeah. No idea of the film then. <laughs> no, no. Well, I'm, I'm sad Reese didn't get it because there's a film about ice skating. Oh. It's called Ice Castles. <laughs> oh, blind. Yeah, this is somebody who got blinded by... Uh, by the, oh. uh, by an ice skating accident. So had I known, I would have removed that for you, Reese. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. At least I didn't get blind, which is a, which is a positive. That is true. Okay, next up, Makari. Me, Reese. Deaf. Eternals. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, that is the second one that David sent me. Superheroes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, yeah, there's two of them, you know. It's because that's their character name and they it's constantly used in the film. Yeah. A lot of them it's kind of their that's their name. It might get told once. Yeah. That's Baby the that's, driver one I should have got though. That that's annoying me. But that's the that's the point, right? <laughs> oh, there are no, course, there's, no, there should be it. more of these <laughs> high profile ones. The fact that no, of course like, that is why it's the, it's a game, right? It's meant to be. No, it's not just the fact. It's also this game would be much easier if the Hollywood system wasn't so biased against these characters. Yeah. Do better. Anyway, we've got yeah, a couple left. Um, next up, uh, number fourteen is Frank Rossi. Me, Reese, mute. They are deaf from the film Coda. Oh, just sounded like an Italian gangster film. It'd be a mute. <laughs> okay. Rossi. Okay, next character. Wait, did I read that right? Sorry. And they all deaf in Coda. Isn't that the whole point of the film? Yeah. I was thinking that. Yeah. All but one. It was all it, but one. Co- is it all but one? Is it? Is it? Yeah. Who's that? Coda's is it is child of child of deaf adults, something like that. So yeah. The main character, played by Mia okay. Jones, is the only one who can hear, and she acts as the interpreter for her deaf family. Yeah, and the actor who played that character, I just said, uh, Troy Kotsu, uh, second actor to be either nominated or win whilst being deaf. Okay, so from one Frank to another, we go to Frank Slade. Me. Yep. Blind? Uh, oh. Any idea of the film? <laughs> no idea. It's a, f- a scent of a woman, a.k.a. Al Pacino. Uh, That's Al Pacino's character. Some good guesses yeah. in there, KD. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, we have two I left. I got that one. That's going to annoy me all night. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to hate to watch that film. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I love that film. That's going to annoy me so much. Okay, next up, Eli. Me. Yep. 
blind. Oh, wow. Any idea of the film? Uh, Book of Eli. The Book of Eli? Yeah. 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 Denzel, right? Yes, indeed it is, Denzel. I'm going to give a bonus point for that one. (laughs) Oh, wait. (laughs) Oh, I I thought you had the buzzer for some reason. (laughs) Now I've only lost by single digits. That's the buzzer. Wait. Okay. (laughs) Our final character, Thomas A. Anderson. Me. Reese. Mute. Mute the Matrix when they take his mouth away. So... It was blind, but I am going to give you the bonus point because it was from Matrix. Right. So you're right, it is Neo, but they specific, specified blind for when he's in the real world and the machines have blinded him. Um, oh, I thought it was the oh. bit where they took his mouth away and he couldn't uh, speak. Yeah. Yeah, he's probably more pr- predominantly blind. I get it when, like they do the, when they take the eyes away, yeah. they burn the eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But like I said, I feel like giving I two out of three points is generous at that point. It still oh, counts. Yeah. I think, yeah. I mean, if you're willing to say that being mute is also correct, I'm also willing to give it as correct. Whichever. <laughs> okay, in that case, <laughs> it doesn't make a difference in the score, anyway, so let's give it to him. Yeah, I, yeah, I think <laughs> given the lot, I think given the reasoning given, uh, I'm willing to accept it. Yeah. So in that case, we now come to the final scores. So we have Reese on a respectable six, uh, but Katie with 14. Very nice. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, as we've already alluded to, you now get the choice of which set of films you have. So, you have David's, you have your own, or you have Reese's. So, you can go for whichever one you want. Can I, can I find out which ones? On, about- only once oh. you decide. <laughs> oh, God. So you have um, lots of information to go for <laughs> if you well, choose David's. Well. <laughs> uh, you know what? Uh, let's go with Reese's okay. choice. Oh, okay. All right, Reese. Well, my choice is Paddington 1 <laughs> and Paddington uh, 2. <laughs> well done. <laughs> oh, this is three, great. I had three options. And because I, I, can't, I couldn't remember how we done it last time, I, Paddington 1 and Paddington 2 was, was what I wanted to go with. But just in case you said yours beforehand, it was Hellboy 1 and 2 and then Doctor Strange. Uh, those are, my, those are my choices. Hellboy 1 and 2 were my choices. Yeah, that's what I kind of thought that would, what I thought most people would go for. Yeah. Um, and then I had Doctor Strange and then Doctor Strange and Multiverse, Multiverse of Madness because yeah. of Stolberg. Ah, well, yeah. My, and what were your, what were your? That's what my, I was just like, okay, I know people potentially go down the Del Toro route. So I went like completely off grid. I considered like Pirates of the Caribbean or something, but I went for Hunger, the Games. Hunger Games and Hunger Games Catching Fire uh, to kind of go with that franchise stuff, but still some of the themes. Oh, this is great. So literally over the weekend, I got to tell Niall about my story watching Paddington. Now I can tell it again on the podcast. And out of all the films I possibly could have picked, if you haven't seen Paddington 1 and Paddington 2, then they definitely need to be watched. So I I think it's a nice... Nice pair, two and, nice pair of films to watch. Yeah, over I've seen Paddington uh, for circumstances that David is aware of yeah. and laugh. Well, it's okay to laugh at. I have not and seen to Paddington think it's, two. Okay, so Paddington two, I, I shit you not, excuse my language, is a masterpiece. <laughs> when I came into the house earlier, it was actually on the telly as well, so it was it was just it was meant to be. I I watched it the first time last year. Because I somehow, somehow kept missing it. And all my friends were like saying, you have to watch this. And it was like one film that we had to watch party. I was like, oh, this film is so sweet and so amazing. And after it being referenced in another film that was shown, released this year, I'm not going to say because it it's going to be, that's a spoiler. It, yeah, Reese said, said this is a masterpiece. <laughs> and that scene in that film had me in absolute hysterics. I know. One of the funniest films of the year. Yeah. And that's the vibes we wanted. We're going to have this summer break and everyone's going to be <laughs> waiting for us like, we want Paddington too. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, what we wanted. So thank you guys. Yeah, awesome. That was uh, a great win there from Katie and uh, very uh, cour- courteous of you to uh, choose Reese's films. And I-, I suppose we're all very happy from the choice as well. So everyone's a winner uh, in this situation. And um, yeah, we've really enjoyed talking about The Shape of Water, uh, which uh, made it into the movie vault this week. Um, and it's been a privilege having you guys on. Uh, thank you for joining us again, Reese, and uh, thank you for making your debut, Katie. Uh, so, where can the people find you? What are some of your socials and the projects or uh, content that you're involved in at the moment, Katie? Where, where can the people find you? 
Um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Katie Smith Wong. That's Katie with an I E. Or you can see my reviews on Flick Feast, Music, Movies, and Hoops, as well as Film Stories. Awesome. Check it out. And uh, Reese, yourself? So the best thing to do is to find me on Twitter where I have a link tree in my bio which takes you to uh, my YouTube page where I do uh, movie reviews and then a website called The Cinematic where I'm a senior writer. Uh, my Twitter page is at Rio's Positive POV. Rio's is R-E-O-S Positive, the normal way, and then POV. Um, everything is on there, but I'm, I'm very active on Twitter. So if you want to have some discussions in regards to movies, especially the shape of water they give me a shout awesome yes bring uh, bring your opinions to reese even if you don't like the shape of water like I said sometimes you will often politely disagree <laughs> but i will tell you you were wrong and then i will block you <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah awesome go check out uh, all of that great content and uh yeah it's been uh, absolutely great talking about the shape of water this week uh, anything lastly from yourself craig look after yourselves <laughs> I feel that just needs to be said. I don't know why. (laughs) So thank you everyone uh, for joining us. We'll catch you on the next episode. Thank you, Katie and Reese, And uh, we look forward to talking about Paddington. Bye-bye. Bye. To keep up with the latest episodes of Well Good Movies, you can listen to us on all your usual podcast outlets, including Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, and more. Don't forget to follow us, subscribe, and rate us where you can to keep our podcast growing. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at WellGoodMovies to keep up with the latest news and highlights from all our episodes, as well as tell us what movies you want to be discussed in the future. And if all of that isn't enough, you can also find us at our website, freshtakehub.com slash wellgoodmovies, where you can catch all our episodes along with videos and articles deep diving into the worlds of film and television. So what are you waiting for? Go check out the film we'll be discussing in next time's episode.